Majors, Abby Williams and Libby German were best friends living in the small rural community of Delphi, Indiana. On February 13, 2017, the girls had a day off from school, so they decided to go on an outdoor adventure. They were dropped off near the Monin High Bridge, and while on that bridge, Libby recorded a man with her phone, uttering the words... <laughs> It was down the hill where Libby and Abby would be murdered. Prosecutors say the man on the bridge is responsible, and that man is Richard Allen. But Allen and his attorneys say prosecutors have it all wrong. They say Allen is innocent, and it was someone else on the bridge that day who took the lives of these two innocent girls. The trial has begun, and the judge has banned cameras and all electronic communication from inside the courtroom. But Court TV is there in Indiana inside the courtroom and tonight we have all the details and all the latest from this high profile trial live from Indiana. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Wow, what a day here at Court TV. There are so many things happening all at once. Uh, we're going to get to these big stories, but I want to let you know that the trial of Sarah Boone, the suitcase murder trial, We've got a full hour of that coming up. Okay, Vinny Politan investigates, deep dive, getting into the testimony, into the issues, into the madness that is the suitcase murder trial. Full hour coming up right after this program, 9 o'clock. Vinny Politan investigates. Do not miss it. But we're going to start with Abby and Libby, the two girls who died violent deaths in Delphi, Indiana. Delphi, Indiana. I mean, a place where you should be able to walk wherever you want in safety. That's one of the reasons you live there. That's why you raise a family there. That's why when your kids want to go for a hike in the woods, you're not really worried about it. But it was worst case scenario for these two families and these two young girls. Now, when we talk about Delphi, and the investigation into what happened and who was responsible, it has just struck me that this is a town with, it seems like a lot of secrets. Like the whole investigation, little pieces were revealed by investigators who didn't solve this thing for five years and obviously needed some help. But everything was very secretive, very secretive much more so than most cases, especially cases that are like five years old and going cold. And they sent out all these cryptic little clues that were seemingly disconnected from one another and made no sense to the public, but they were still looking, looking, looking and searching and searching and searching, yet keeping things very secretive. And in the end, it turns out, the person they've accused, they spoke to like the first or second day of this investigation and just basically messed it up. Like, big time messed it up. If they believe this, if, if you believe this guy is the killer, because not everybody does. Not everybody believes that Richard Allen is, is, is the murderer here. So the, the question for this trial, this secret trial in Indiana, is will the truth be revealed? Well, you and I aren't going to see it. We're not going to hear it. Because that's the other part of what's happening here. No cameras, no electronic communications, keeping people out from seeing a trial where many people who've been looking at this are questioning some of the evidence. Is there enough evidence? Is there evidence someone else could have done it? Is the, is the truth going to be revealed? Well, we won't know. The jury will have to tell us and we'll have to trust them. The jury will have to tell us and we'll have to trust them. You know, in, in, in a case where things have been so secretive and took so long to solve when the person you are charging was on your radar right in the beginning saying he was there, it makes you question a lot of things. And, and the best way to gain the trust of the public is the transparency that doesn't exist here. It just doesn't exist. That's why... We're sending our people, folks. And joining us tonight in Delphi, Indiana, Court TV senior producer Barbara McDonald, who's been covering this story for years and is there seeing and hearing everything. Also with us, someone else who's been all over this story, 
criminal defense attorney, host of Defense Diaries, Bob Mata, is with us as well. Thank you both. Um, Barbara, let me before I get into the into what happened today and what's taking place, you know, in terms of testimony, evidence, etc. Just set the scene. Am I? I'm reading it from afar. You're on the ground there. Is this like every other case, or does it, it, it seem like they don't want people there? They, I, I, I just get this feeling that they don't want anyone to really pay attention to it. They don't want anyone. They don't want people from around the country talking about it, reporting about it. They just want to be left alone, and that's not the way our system of justice works. But is that the reality on the ground, or is that just me reading it from afar? No, I think it's a pretty um, accurate. I'm going to start with it, Barbara. I'm sorry, Bob. Start with Barbara, then we'll get get, get your take, Bob. There are a lot of restrictions on the people who are attending the trial, not just members of the media, but members of the public. People are having to line up uh, throughout the night to get a seat. There are very limited seats inside. The judge is making available the exhibits that are shown each day in court at the end of the day for 15 minutes to the members of the media who were in court that day. They can go into the well of the courtroom and view those those items. Uh, but you can't touch anything. Uh, there were hundreds of pictures shown today. She laid them all out on every available surface in the courtroom for us to look at and reminded us several times we couldn't touch anything. One of the reporters said, you know, one of the exhibits, I can't read the number on it. Can I just move the other page that's on top of it? And she said no, and she came over and did that. Um, so there is definitely... Uh, heightened um, security and focus on the restrictions and the rules that are keeping everyone almost at bay in this. Um, it is very hard to hear people in the courtroom. It's hard to hear certain things that witnesses say, questions that are asked of them. And uh, we all just have to sort of compare notes. And did you hear this? Did you hear that? How did you hear that? Um, and it's a, a very difficult way of covering a case to try to be as accurate as you possibly can. And, and it's, it's interesting. Like, we've, we cover big stories all the time. I mean, from, from Johnny Depp to Alec Murdoch to um, Scott Peterson. And there's all different rules and things. But I have found, you know, in the, in the low country, I found in Virginia, I found in even even with the Harvey Weinstein, there was a, a sense of, OK, we know you guys are here. We'll, we'll, we'll figure this out together. Um, Bob, what, what's your take on, on, on that? Is it, is it different what we're feeling here or is it just that it's a big story in a little town and they, and they just don't want the, the, the people around there? No, I mean, look, the reality is it's a very small courtroom. That's there's no question about that. But the way that they're handling it. And for instance, the people that are camping out for the 23 or 24 seats that are available to the public, they're not allowed to leave for lunch because they clear the, the courtroom for lunch break, which means it's a free, it's free game. So those folks who slept outside, who are wanting to watch a full day that they've earned by sleeping, out outside on the concrete now have to skip lunch and stay in line until they open the courtroom back up so they can run in and get a seat again it's i've never seen anything like it to be wow. honest with you. You okay know? i mean I, i've been yeah i've been covering cases for a while and i've tried cases for much much longer and i've never seen anything like this to be yeah. honest with you well, well we'll see how things progress here the, the most important thing is that the truth comes out, hopefully, in the, in the courtroom. So, Barbara, yeah, you and the jury, you saw pictures of the crime scene today. Paint the picture of what you saw. Uh, just dozens and dozens of images of the scene, um, looking at the area where the bodies were found from the creek and from different vantage points as they moved closer and closer to the bodies. Some of the things I noticed, first of all, was how hard it was to see the girls until you were pretty much right on top of them. You could kind of see something off in the distance, but you certainly couldn't tell what it was. Abby was a little bit harder to see from a distance because her clothing coloring sort of blended in with the environment. Libby was found nude. She didn't have any clothing on 
uh, her body was very white. Both of them appeared very, very white to me. And the other thing that we saw in these photographs is just how much blood was at the scene, not only on these girls. Libby had more blood on her entire body. Um, Abby's was more concentrated to the neck area where her injuries were. But just south of where the girls were located, just a few feet from their bodies, perhaps two feet from their bodies, was a large pool of blood. The tree that Libby was up next to was not the tree that had the F marking on it, as people have come to know. That tree was a couple of feet away from Abby, and next to that tree was a smaller patch of blood. The other thing we learned from these photographs is that that F tree not only had that blood marking that some people have interpreted to be some sort of a runic symbol or letter F, but there was another spot of blood on that same tree over on one of the sides of the tree. Uh, Bob, your, your thoughts about this. The, the, what, what, is that, what does that tell us about the scene? What does that tell us about the significance of, of where these girls are found and how they're found? It, it seems that the blood is all there. That had to be where they were murdered. I mean, that's that's clearly what the state needs to, to be the case in terms of, you know, we know at this point the defenses, or at least one of the defense's theories, is that the girls were taken off seat and that they were brought back at some point. Uh, so that that's obviously something that, that the state wants very much to be the case in terms of where the, the murders actually occurred. And it's interesting that Barbara was talking about, uh, you know, we did, we went through just these gut-wrenching photographs of the girls, and they were really on display for uh, the whole courtroom. They had on, they were on that 85-inch monitor they have in there, and they were, as you can imagine, devastating to look at for the better course of the day, really. Um, but what was interesting is that the first photographs that they they were showing to the jurors were from a distance, and as Barbara aptly noted, they were very. It was very difficult to see the girls. So, and again, did, did it strike another, you as a ritualistic scene? I, I, I think that the the sticks were arranged definitely. I, it didn't look like they were just strewn on the girls in order to try to cover them or to make them kind of blend in. They they definitely looked placed to me. But I'm no expert, you know, and it, and my opinion means nothing. It's all going to depend on. Well, it what does. The it does think. in a case where everything's being like not shown to the public, and you get to see it, right? So your opinion right. actually means something. Penny, if I may, one of the things I did not notice in the photos that were shown today was the defense has characterized some of the sticks and twigs that were above Abby's head as being almost in a horn-like pattern. I did not see that in the photographs. Nobody pointed out specifically what sticks might have been horns. I didn't see anything that resembled anything looking like horns or placed deliberately above her head. The sticks that were on their bodies definitely looked like they had been placed there deliberately. That's yeah, I, I agree. I didn't see anything either, Barbara. I was looking for like kind of the antlers or the horns right. and I, I didn't see right. it. I didn't see those either. Okay, let's talk about uh, the clothing that Abby Williams w was was found in. What's the significance there, Barbara? Well, first of all, we already knew that she was found in Libby's clothing. She was wearing Libby's jeans and Libby's hoodie. Uh, what the crime scene investigators talked about today is that her clothing was wet to the touch. All of it was, including her shoes. She was wearing her Converse sneakers. Um, and that all of her clothing was wet or moist to the touch with the tops of the jeans, uh, the top parts of her thighs. That was, they said, starting to dry, but the areas where the jeans were sort of crumpled up was definitely more damp. And they said it was not from condensation, that it was more consistent with having been in the water. The other thing was, even though Abby was wearing her Converse shoes, when they took those shoes off and photographed the bottoms of her feet, her feet did appear dirty with debris from the area, as if her shoes had been off at some point and then put back on. So if they're crossing the creek, Bob, that's significant, right? For the state. 
Yeah, yeah that's their whole theory. I mean, they, they need they need the creek to be crossed in order for Richard Allen to be their guy, uh, because if it happened uh, where they didn't cross the creek, then that that kind of blows their whole theory up. So they definitely need that that creek to have been crossed, which is why whether or not the clothes were wet. Uh, has been a real bone of contention on cross-examination. And, and frankly, there were two of the CSI guys that kind of give a little bit of contradictory testimony. Uh, the, the last witness up said that they were wet to the touch, as Barbara noted, but earlier in the day, uh, I, I think it was the second witness, the second CSI said they were they were a little damp. Like he just, he had a different, but he, he wasn't really touching things either. Like, and he was kind of a hands-off CSI. Our, our last witness for the day was what they termed the lead investigator as far as the CSI went. So he was far more hands-on than anybody else that, that had testified today. Barbara, what else was found in that, in that creek? So in the creek, we, we knew that they had found a tie-dye shirt and a Nike shoe. In addition to that, Abby's jeans and her underwear or somebody's underwear was in the jeans and it looked like they had all been taken off one time and were completely inside out all the clothing that was found in the creek was described as being inside out including that tie-dye shirt in addition to that they also found a pink sock the gray hoodie that abby had been wearing earlier in the day that had belonged to kelsey a black tank top and a black sock and they were not all found in the same exact area the hoodie the gray hoodie that abby had been wearing was actually completely submerged in the creek and i believe the jeans were also fully submerged some of the other items were more stuck to, on debris in the creek and could be visible from the surface of the creek. Bob, if, I think to take off your own pants, it's very difficult to make them inside out. Someone yeah, else has got to be it, taking those off. Or they were wet. Like, that that's the thing. You know, I mean, have you ever had wet jeans and you tried to peel them off, Vinny? I mean, they're tough to take off. So that, that could definitely be a situation where that would uh, push that that kind of that motive or not necessarily that motive but that that theory forward that the girls had to cross the the creek um but yeah they're 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 tough to get off if they're not wet all the way inside out and, and i agree with barbara that's exactly how it appeared is that they were pulled off all in kind of one fell swoop just pulled off and not necessarily by by libby right and and how how far away, and, and, and if, quickly, if you know, how far away is the, the stuff in the creek from where the girls are found? I, I think they testified uh, between 40 and 50 feet. Okay. Maybe between 30 and 50. So, okay. and relatively they were strewn close. about. Right, strewn about, but relatively yeah. close. All right, Barbara, finally, let's talk about the bullet that was found at the scene. Now, the girls weren't shot. Their, their throats were slit. Correct. And they didn't find the bullet... It wasn't visible to the naked eye as they were at the crime scene. Uh, they testified, the crime scene investigators, that as it got a little bit darker, they started to use this alternative light source uh, technology that they have that requires the use of goggles. And that looks for biological material, saliva or semen, something like that. And the two of the crime scene investigators had those goggles on and were looking for that type of material. The third investigator who was there did not have the goggles on. And he said, as the light went over a particular area, he saw something that was glittering or, or shiny. And so when they zoomed in on that area and took a closer look at it and moved some of the leaves away. They were able to see this bullet that was uh, tip side down in the ground. The only part that was exposed was the primer or the head stamp area that showed it was an unfired 40 caliber Smith and Wesson bullet. Um, and that the rest of it was underground. Uh, there was a lot of debate about whether or not, from the defense rather, that whether or not that should have been videotaped or that more photos should have been taken of it once it was taken out of the ground to show that tip. And the crime scene investigators all said that they didn't feel that that was necessary at the scene, that the photos that they took were certainly enough to show that. Um, and 
Andrew Baldwin at one point said, you know, how do we know that the bullet that was taken out of the ground is the same one that may end up in court um, admitted as evidence? And it was interesting because one of the jurors asked a question about that when they were given that opportunity. And the question was, would there be any reason the bullet submitted as evidence would be a different bullet. And the crime scene investigator talked about the chain of custody and how, no, what the bullet that was collected at the scene, they didn't take better photos of it at the scene because they didn't have the lens for it. And they felt that that needed microscopic examination. And so that was all sent to the lab. But that bullet was found on the 14th uh, through that alternative light um, testing. Let me ask you, Bob, how important is this bullet in this case? I, I think it's their biggest piece of evidence aside from the confessions. I mean, it's their it's their case. You know, I mean, if you were to strip away the confessions, if we're going to go by Nick McClellan's opening statement, we've heard everything that they had. There was no bombshell that came out. There was no additional evidence. We were all like, well, do they have more? Did they get evidence post-arrest? Which, you know, law enforcement's always counting on. You know, I'm sure when they were going through his devices. They were hoping they were going to find stuff to connect him to the murders, and none of that happened. So, you know, strip away the confessions, which obviously we can't, but just looking at the, the case objectively, you've got him at the bridge and the bullet. And the, and the bullet so they're going to try to match, not the way it's done in most of the cases, that it's a bullet that's been fired and you have the expert look at it. It's just a bullet that was inside the, the 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 weapon and then somehow discharged from it without being Cycled fired through. right just sort of going through the gun but not being fired and you know that's that's not the same level of of definitive uh matching that you would normally get okay we're out of time for tonight but we've got like what another four or five weeks of this so <laughs> Barbara McDonald, Bob Mata, thank you both so, so much. When we come back, we're going to talk about the other great case, uh, big case that's happening here on Court TV, which is the Burn Pile murder trial. Um, a lot to talk about there with our Think Tank Plus coming up next hour.